So hello once again. My name is Dr. Okiri Richard. I continue my podcast on basic cardiology today and we are going to talk about progressive dyspnea angina pectoris and dizziness. You admitted a 73-year-old male patient with symptoms of tightness in the chest as well as progressive exertional dyspnea and dizziness and also tiredness. In the cardio- cardiovascular risk factors, you saw a known arterial hypertension, a dyslipidemia, and as well as a significant nicotine abuse of 27 packet years. He had uh, on physical examination 176 centimeter, 66 kilogram, good general condition, abdominal circumference 87 centimeter. He was uh, well oriented, there were no cyanosis and edema, blood pressure was normal. Heart rate 70 per minute, respiratory rate 12 per minute. There was a bit of jugular venous congestion up to 2 cm above the jugulum. There was also a 3 over 6 systolic murmur above the third intercostal space right with radiation to the carotis. Respiratory and examination, uh, abdominal examination findings were normal. The cardiac markers in the blood test were also normal. That means you could already exclude an acute coronary syndrome. You requested for a 12-channel uh, ECG, a chest X-ray, and echocardiography. In the chest X, uh, in the ECG, the axis was overturned right axis. Sinus rhythm 59 per minute. P, uh, PQ, QROS, and P intervals and time were all okay. Arrow progression was still normal and there were no repolarization disturbances. In the chest x-ray, you saw a flattened diaphragm. The heart side was normal. There was aortic elongation, aortic sclerosis, and the and the prominent upper mediastinum. There was significant peribron, peribronchial prominence as you usually have in nicotine abuses. There were no congestion, no pleural effusion, no actiliptasis, no pneumothorax, and no infiltration. In the echocardiography, the aortic root was normal size, at ascending uh, aorta also. Tricuspid aortic valve that was a bit thickened, with reduced opening area, there was mild central regurgitation with eccentric jet, jet towards AML. The hemodynamic Vmax was 4.09 meters per second. Maximum pressure gradient 67 millimeters of mercury. Mean pressure gradient 36 millimeters of mercury. The opening surface area was 0.7 centimeters squared according to the continuity balance. But according to the AOF, it was KOF, sorry, it was 0.4 squared centimeters. The left left ventricular end systolic and end diastolic dimensions were okay. There was an asymmetrical asymmetrical septum hypertrophy, IVS 16, left ventricular posterior wall 15. Systolic global function was okay. There there was even some signs of hypercontractility with fractional shortening of 49%. There were no regional contractility disturbances, diastolic dysfunction grade 1. The mitral valve was mildly calcified, but the valves were as those expected for the age and the movement were okay. They were physiologic in regurgitation, no stenosis. Tricuspid valve was still okay with normal movement and physiologic insufficient with maximum pressure gradient from ROV to ROA of 23 millimeters of mercury. Wow! So I've talked so much now. My question is how are you going to judge? or grade the stenosis of this aortic valve and which test do you still require well in the grading of the aortic valve you use three criteria which is the opening surface area the middle pressure gradient and the maximum uh, velocity across the valve in mild you have opening area more than 1.5 square centimeter with a middle gradient lower than 25 millimeters of mercury and a gent a jet Vmax lower than 3.0 meters per second. 
in the moderate aortic valve stenosis. The opening area is between 1.0 and 1.5 centimeter squared. The middle pressure gradient is between 25 and 40 millimeters of mercury. And the jet is between 3 to 4 meters per second. In severe aortic stenosis, you have the opening area less than 1 square centimeter, a middle gradient of above 40 millimeters of mercury, and a V max of above 4 meters per second. So, based on these findings and what we have on this patient, we have a case of a severe aortic valve stenosis with a maximum jet above 4 meters per second. This is only global function in this patient with concentric left ventricular hypertrophy and sorry, the function is good or maybe hypercontractile. So that the clinical presentation of this patient and the cardiac structural changes are in keeping with the valvular stenosis. In planning for a valvular replacement or an operation or valvular replacement operation, I need to do a cardiac catheterization. Okay, you did the select uh, the cardiac catheterization. In the selective presentation of the left coronary artery, the hop, uh, mean stem was okay. The descending branch, anterior descending branch, had a 50% stenosis, and in the proximal part, and also a 50 to 75 stenosis in the milliard part. The second flank branch also branch also had a 50% stenosis. The right coronary artery had a subtotal stenosis in the proximal part. You did not do a, redo, re, a retrograd uh, vent, uh, levography to the uh, autography because the findings we already had uh, is a clear indication for an operation by, with a high grade aortic valve stenosis. Okay, so for what you say now, you are planning to do an aortic valve replacement operation combined with a bypass supply, a care to the river, that is um, left anterior descending artery and also the right coronary artery. That is good. My question is now, which is tests are you still going to request for? What tests are you going to do pre-operatively? Well, I will do carotid duplex sonography, HIV hepatitis serology, and lung function test. Some surgeons, or most surgeons, will really wish to do a transosophageal echocardiography. Here, you did a transosophageal echocardiography. The aortic valve was thickened but mildly calcified. There was reduced opening movement of the tricuspid valve with reduced separation of the left and right coronary leaflets. Through the planimetry, you got an opening area of 1.5 square centimeter and there was a moderate central regurgitation. Ascending, descending and thoracic aorta were normal. My question is nice. What grade will you take to grade this aortic valve stenosis, which method do you know are useful to quantify aortic valve opening area? Please discuss this and what parameters in the echocardiographic findings support your discussion. Well, according to the just stated Opening, surface opening area of the valve, we have a moderate stenosis. So let me tell you the benefits and disadvantage of the grading method with the echocardiography. Well, through the VMAX, which can go using the continuous wave Doppler across the aortic valve in meters per second, you can actually get the maximum flow through the aortic valve. The advantage here is that it gives a direct measurement of the speed across the valve and it can be used as the most as the strongest predictor for clinical outcome. But the restriction or the shortfall is that this is actually dependent on the quality of the Doppler signal. And don't forget that the Vmax is usually low in patients with reduced ejection fraction. Sometimes the aortic valve stenosis will be underrated or not even recognized in this settings. But don't forget, they could be overestimation 
when you have mitral insufficiency or aortic valve insufficiency, regurgitation valve insufficiency. So number two, the number one is the V max in the echocardiography. Number two, you can do the me uh, measurement of the pressure gradient, which is also got into the continuous wave Doppler after the Bernoulli equation. This is usually in millimeters of mercury, and the mean pressure gradient in millimeters of mercury is actually four times the mean V max squared. Actually, is is four times the squared of the V max. The benefit here, or the good thing here, is that the this can be measured through the flow, and there is good correlation with the invasive measurements. Restrictions are, or that is, is actually dependent of the quality of the blast signal, like the other one. So number three, the, apart from the Vmax and the pressure gradient, another uh, echocardiographic parameter you can use is the measurement of the opening area, which is done through the continuity equation, which is equal to the effective surface area in centimeters squared. It is actually an easy equation according to the concept of a correlation between the surface and flow across the left ventricular output tract and the aortic valve, which is the formula A1 times V1 equals A2 times V2. So A2 now equals A1 times V1 over V2. Where A1 is the surface area of the left ventricular outflow tract and V1 is the flow across of the left ventricular outflow tract. This can be gotten through the pulse wave Doppler and it's a meter per second. But the A2 now is the opening surface area, which is what we are looking for, across the aortic valve. And the V2 is the speed, the V mass across the aortic valve, gotten through the C wave Doppler and it's a meter per second. Don't forget that to get the A1, which is the surface area of the left ventricular outflow tract, you have to do the diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract, divide by 2, square the result times a constant n. So, in this uh, measurement of the opening area and this, form, this form formula, the advantage is that you can really get an effective opening area, but the restriction is that many, there are so many influencing parameters like the diameters of the left ventricular outflow tract squared and the flow. But the disadvantage is that, first of all, it is dependent on the ability to have an optimal window for during the echocardiography and in about 40% of the cases is not possible due to calcification. So now let me come back to this patient. In the first case we saw an echocardiographic finding of a high high uh, grade aortic valve stenosis and later on we are seeing a moderate aortic valve stenosis. What explanation do you have for this discrepancy in this find in the findings this discrepancy in the findings well according to the planimetry we have a mid moderate aortic valve stenosis the maximum uh, jet v max is minimally above the uh, elevated into the high stenosis area which is 4.09 and the middle gradient is below 40 mm of mercury which is more likely to be a middle grade the present presentation of this patient is therefore explained through the severe coronary heart disease or the aortic valve stenosis. Good. Now my next question to you now, when do you think an invasive diagnostic is indicated? Usually when the non-invasive tests are unspecific or there's a discrepancy between the clinical presentation, then you need to do an invasive diagnostic to do a hemodynamic evaluation of the pressure relationship, class 1C. Don't forget that for before you do a valvular replacement operation in patients with high risk of coronary heart disease, you really have to do a coronary angiography. So in patients where it is not clear how to evaluate the, or how to put the non-invasive examination finding or their discrepancies to do an invasive catheterization to analyze the pressure curve will be necessary and is possible. 
But don't forget, in this case, you have to really take care to prevent a retrograde embolize, central embolization. Sorry, in this case, don't forget that you really have to take care to prevent central embolization during the retrograde sun retraction of the electrode from the ventricles into the aort aorta in the heart catheterization you either use the gorlin g o r o l i n gorlin formula or peak to peak gradient so you did an a, an invasive diagnostic sis, where you saw the subtotal ROCA proximal stenosis because of the morphologic findings and the planimetry findings with mid mid moderate aortic stenosis you actually decide to do the primary coronary intervention of the right coronary artery thereafter the patient became asymptomatic my next question now is that now that the patient is asymptomatic how are you going to monitor the progress of the aortic stenosis asymptomatic patient with a rapid progression of the stenosis cooled according to clinic cap presentation that is angina pectoris this is net syncope or heart failure signs and echocardiographic criteria which is elevation of the flow of above 0.3 meters per second per year or reduction of the opening area of more than 0.1 square centimeter per year they can be diagnosed those are criteria to diagnose rapid progressive aortic valve stenosis that means when you have zero, more than 0 0.3 meters per second increase in the vmax or when you have more than one 0 0.1 centimeter a square centimeter reduction in the opening area per year the vmax has a very great prognostic role don't forget that even patients with that asymptomatic but we that have asymptomatic high-grade aortic valve stenosis with rapid progression, they still have in a 2A to 2A indication for a valvular replacement. In patients with mild asymptomatic stenosis, you repeat the echocardiography yearly, but in patients with high, um, severe asymptomatic stenosis, the interval is 3 to 6 months. A Hemodynamic progression is most likely in patients above 50 years of age that have severe valve calcification or and severe coronary heart disease. The most asymptomatic patient with hemodynamic relevant aortic stenosis develop symptoms in the following five years. A preventive operation is generally not needed, not indicated. It can you can do a stress ECG in these patients as a form of risk risk stratification. If you have pathologic reactions like angina pectoris, dyspnea, hypotension, or failure of blood pressure rise, you expect this patient to develop a symptomatic aortic valve disease in near future so in this patient you really have to consider in this patient group you really have to consider the operation indication thank you very much